Hello, my name is Mark Welsh from Integration Training. I lead leadership, stress management, resilience, various kinds of corporate training and training for NGOs around the world. Um, I've lived in a whole bunch of different countries myself. I've been to about 10 countries this year and I'm working with at least 50 nationalities this year. There's a lot of the groups that I work with are very cross-cultural. So this video is about understanding and working cross-culturally. This is incredibly important because on, certainly on one level we're not the same. Culture still exists. We, are, we do things differently. We, how we do things around here is a nice definition of culture and uh, it's different in different places. I know this is a lot of the businesses I work with, they, they, even if they're internationally educated and well-traveled, they will still have cultural misunderstandings. This can be a cause of a lot of pain. It can be a real deal breaker for people. So it's also worth saying there's other ways to look at culture, right? We could look at the culture in a department or a company or with an age group or many different ways. So a country is only one way of splitting and looking at culture. Um, I think it's, it's still a very useful one. We're not all, not all kind of uh, citizens of the world 100% yet. So I travelled around a lot um, when I was doing a lot of my training and still do. And I, I kind of got curious, like, okay, so there's lots of cultures, but some of them seem kind of the same. Like, how are the Japanese similar to the Ethiopians? There's, there's some ways in which they are, even though they're totally different in other ways. Um, eventually, I found some work by um, a Dutch father and son called, I believe, Hoofstader and Hoofstader. Now, if you're Dutch and I'm mispronouncing that, I sincerely apologise. My Dutch is very poor. So anyway, these guys have got this, did some research, originally for IBM and uh, then with all kinds of other companies, so it's evidence-based. And they said, what are the fundamental variables in which cultures differ? Because if we can understand these, then whatever culture you go to, you can realise pretty quickly what are the important things. So I was in Ivory Coast, for example, uh, and not long ago, and I quickly realised, OK, here are the variables. So one they use is called power distance, for example. Um, this is how much hierarchies are valued. Some places like the Netherlands or Sweden is much flatter, and in a meeting, for example, you sort of, anyone speaks when they want, and you listen to everybody's points of view before making a consensus decision. Other countries, say uh, Russia, many Arabic countries, many African countries, not the case at all, much more hierarchical. The most important person speaks first and for the longest and then the next and then so on. Um, very different to work in those, those, those kind of, kind of countries and companies. So power distance. Next one would be individualism and collectivism. So some countries like the USA, for example, more individualistic. Yeah. Uh, some countries much more collective in terms of how people do things and like to do things. So again, this has some uh, practical consequences in terms of how you work. One that's a little harder to understand is uncertainty avoidance. So in some places people are really okay with not knowing what's happening. In other places they'd like it to be very clear exactly what's happening when and they, for example, as a trainer, may want the training schedule months in advance with all the times in. Other countries say, hey, just turn up and do your thing. Yeah. Um, how new ideas are received in these countries is going to be pretty different. And some might be much more speaking to the traditional techniques of try and tested. Others, like say the USA, much more kind of innovative, looking at what's new, what's fresh, that's what they value. So differences. Next term, and I think it's a misleading term one needs to be careful with, is masculinity. So Hufstede uh, says that certain countries are more masculine, and he doesn't mean so, so much about gender roles. He's more talking about whether... Uh, traditional traits traditionally associated with masculinity, such as competitiveness, competitiveness, are more valued or not. And he says in some places like Japan, they very much are, and in other places, say um, Thailand, not so much. In the more what he calls feminine countries, it might be more about quality of life and relationship. So um, someone like Spain, for example, and, and this classification would be considered more, more feminine. Long-term orientation is the last one. So this was added later on. Um, certain Asian countries, for example, like China and Japan, they'll have, um, you know, I've heard of 200-year plans for business. A 10-year plan would not be considered a long time, whereas, say, for an American business, a 10-year plan would be considered a long-term plan. So this long-term orientation is, um, you know, that's a big deal too to take into account. Other things I've found really useful to take into account, um, food. Food is massive. Food is part of business. It's cultures around food and drinking as well. Um, really worth considering, you know, do you have two hour long business lunches or do you have a sandwich at your desk? And if you have anything more, people will think badly of you. 
So um, time, time is huge, different in different countries. Um, you know, is it sort of inshallah, we'll see what happens, I'll meet you round about midday, or is it, you know, I was in Switzerland once and I was told off for being one minute late for an appointment and, um, you know, I had to get across a mountain range to get to that appointment. Um, you know, and I was like, hey, even from a British point of view, we're fairly tight about time, but not that much. And I was kind of shocked, you know, and it's very easy when there's a cross-cultural misunderstanding to go into judgment, to go, well, they're bad and wrong and stupid, rather than saying, well, you know, they're raised differently, so they've got different um, standards. Potentially the hardest ones I've seen cross-culturally, dating, very easy to get wrong, can cause all kinds of disasters. Um, ask me privately sometime and I'll let you know some of those. Um, another one would be humour. I think humour is potentially the hardest thing to get right cross-culturally. Um, I make a lot of jokes in my talks and sometimes cross-culturally it's a big mistake. So humour is worth considering. So there you go. I hope that's been interesting. Please like this video down below if you've liked it. Uh, comment if you have any questions or things you'd like to add. And of course if you want any training cross-culturally then get in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.